Canada is, is known for being a world leader, isn't it, in, in the number of prosecutions, uh, at least prosecutions per HIV capita, I guess that's the, the way to express it. Why, we, we're such a nice country. We're known for being a nice country. How has that happened? Well, um, I think I might be partially responsible for the idea that Canada's, Canada's a world leader per capita um, in terms of the analyses that I've done. And it's true that um, uh, uh, Canada is amongst uh, the countries that have prosecuted more people uh, uh, living with HIV. Um, uh, and you're in good or rather bad company with many of the Nordic countries, um, Austria and Switzerland, um, and then some of the states in the United States, but not the whole, not the United States as a whole. Why is Canada? Um, well, I think a lot of the problem uh, stems from the 1998 Currier decision of the Supreme Court. Um, I think the problem of defining uh, HIV non-disclosure as uh, sexual assault, um, if there's a significant risk, and then not explaining in great detail about what significant risk actually means, um, has opened a can of worms. And, uh, you know, the, the, it's just grown and grown. Um, and I think the media coverage of prosecutions has actually created a sense that um, the first thing you do now, if you feel that uh, uh, you've had sex with someone and, they, and you find out later they haven't disclosed, rather than just uh, accept that that was a part of life, uh, the first thing uh, some people are, are doing, and, and increasingly gay men, uh, is going to the police to, to make a complaint. Mm -hmm. Do we, tell me, uh, you mentioned gay men, do we have a profile of the kind of person that is being prosecuted most? I'm thinking Canada, but also worldwide too. For instance, if I'm a white gay male, am I more likely or less likely to be um, uh, fingered by the police, would you say? Um, I'd say less likely. Uh, most of the prosecutions that we know of worldwide uh, when we're talking about sexual uh, exposure transmission, actually uh, are, for are for heterosexual exposure transmission. And I think that's primarily because the people who make the complaints, and, and obviously uh, most complainants are women and uh, most defendants are, are men, um, have never perceived themselves to be at risk of uh, acquiring HIV or of being exposed to HIV. Um, and are not part of communities that are impacted by HIV. And so they really feel that they have been maligned or, or, or treated very badly and are often uh, persuaded by their communities to you know, put that bad person away. Um, and the police often uh, tell uh, uh, women, you know, you're not just doing it for yourself, you're actually protecting the community. Um, but increasingly we are seeing uh, uh, gay men making complaints about other gay men. Um, this didn't really happen until the last uh, decade. Um, and uh, a lot of it seems to me to be around changed perceptions of responsibility for, for safer sex um, and a sense that it's possible to get some kind of justice for a, a, a perception that you've been harmed, even if the harm is just not, not being told that your partner has HIV, even though we know that many people gay men couldn't tell you they have HIV because they're not diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to talk about the public's perception of, of criminalization. Um, we have some recent data in Canada. Um, let me just have a look. Only a minority of Canadians believe that people with HIV have the right to be sexually active, and three quarters of Canadians believe it is appropriate to imprison people who, know, who knowingly fail to disclose their status to a sexual partner. So three quarters of the Canadian public is in favor of criminalization, in favor of imprisonment. Um, how important is it that the public is in fact on our side when these, these issues that tend to be settled at the Supreme Court anyway on the basis of, of legal arguments? And have we done, in fact, a, a good enough job in getting the public on our side? That's a, a difficult question. I'm not sure I can answer it in a, in a minute or two. I think that it really depends on what the, uh, the aims are. Uh, uh, first of all, it depends whether um, you have an HIV-specific law, as they have in, for example, in the United States and many other countries around the world. In Canada, of course, you don't. So in the end, it, it does come down to Supreme Court decisions. Um, but um, you see the media uh, uh, write about uh, uh, prosecutions and uh, responsibility to disclose. 
Um, and the media is both a reflection of public opinion and, of course, uh, informs it as well. So in terms of the general public, I'm guessing that their, their, uh, their information comes from the mainstream media. And so I think, actually, we need to educate journalists. Um, that helps uh, uh, them understand things better. And certainly when I've been interviewed by mainstream journalists in, in Canada, I've impressed upon them the importance of balanced reporting and of not just taking the side of the prosecution. Edwin, it's the case, isn't it, that many people living with HIV are in favor of criminalization also. Um, is, is that a concern also? Should we have done more to, to have people uh, living with HIV on our side, if you wish? Yeah, I mean, I would, yes. I mean, the studies that, that I'm aware of from uh, the US and from the UK um, show a significant minority of people with HIV in favor, so around a third uh, are in favor of prosecutions or, or uh, legal action for non-disclosure exposure. And, and does that concern you? Well, of course uh, it concerns me. Um, I think it, it's part of the broader issue of, of how divisive uh, HIV criminalization is for, um, for our communities and, and for people living with HIV. I think it's very easy to um, dismiss someone uh, uh, who isn't acting like you uh, as being a criminal, when in fact it's far more complicated than that. And I think that um, one of the issues is that we want to feel, uh, as people living with HIV, that well, most of us do anyway, that we, we want to keep the virus to ourselves. we want to be a good person, we want to make sure that we, we uh, uh, are considered to be uh, perhaps uh, even to a higher standard of, of, uh, uh, of moral and ethical uh, 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 issues than than someone who hasn't been diagnosed um, and I think it may be then the, the case that we we dismiss people who uh, don't disclose as being bad um, and uh, it's part of the the, the 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 process of othering in order to feel good about ourselves but there's a huge difference between ethics and morals and uh, and, and whether those things should actually be part of the the criminal law. And I think this is uh, perhaps we do need to uh, uh, have a discussion about whether the criminal law is a is the is the effective is an effective place to deal with these issues when perhaps there are uh, alternative ways to deal with uh, the uh, to deal with when people feel they've been harmed through non disclosure or exposure transmission. We, we don't talk about the we talk a lot about the legal considerations. We don't talk about much about the ethical considerations for disclosure or not. Why do you think that is? I think well, part one of the problems in Canada is that you know since the Courier decision, um, uh, everything's been framed by uh, uh, the, by the law. Um, the, you know the, the Courier decision says if you don't disclose, it's sexual assault. Um, it's interesting, I was looking at the Denver Principles uh, uh, earlier today, and th these were produced by a group of very early and uh, amazingly uh, uh, courageous AIDS activists in 1983. Um, and one of the things that's very interesting about the Denver Principles, um, th they, they state that we're people living with HIV, and we, or that these are people living with AIDS, of course, um, and that we, we have the right to have a full and satisfying sex life. But they also stated that as well as having a responsibility to practice safer sex, which they didn't call it that in those days, they also said there was a, a moral uh, and ethical responsibility to disclose. Um, now, I wonder whether we should reconsider um, disclosure as the be all and end all, because it's not an effective HIV prevention method. Over the 30 years that we have been uh, dealing with the AIDS epidemic, we've learned so much about epidemiology, about risk, about the problems of, the, uh, of people who are undiagnosed actually driving the epidemic. Um, and so now we've moved to zero sorting and disclosure as the, as, as the way, mm -hmm. I mean, both within our community, but also the legal framework is moving towards disclosure. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that works either from an ethical or from an HIV prevention point of view. That in fact, um, given the, the, the advances in science, actually, I know that I have an undetectable viral load. I know I'm using a condom. So that's belt and braces. I don't understand why I also 
have to disclose to my partner that I'm HIV positive, mm -hmm. face rejection, face uh, possibly even worse than that, the loss of that information. Disclosure is just not, it's, it's not the framework. The, the framework should be making sure that HIV is not transmitted from, I mean, obviously from both sides, but the issue of disclosure, I think, is moot, particularly when we're talking about gay men having, uh, having sex. Within a relationship, maybe, you know, over time, when it's safe and you feel like you want to reveal that, I think that, that's a different matter. Yes, and, then, and that's the ethical piece that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Why do you think, it's interesting too, you mentioned the Denver principles and the cheaper principles, which sort of flowed. Mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that, that piece, the, the reference to a moral obligation to disclose, I think that disappeared. Why, why do you think we, we sort of went soft on ethical principles? Well, I think it's because um, as, as we moved, as we got to know more about what works and what doesn't work in terms of HIV prevention and what works and doesn't work in terms of feeling uh, safe uh, and, and, uh, and having dignity as a person living with HIV, I think you know, we started to appreciate that disclosure is incredibly complex. And that it certainly isn't an effective prevention message uh, method, and it, it it also isn't necessarily the uh, the way that we um, uh, ha can have dignity. I mean, I think over time, being open about being HIV positive with the people that we love, with our sexual partners, with our family, with our colleagues uh, in work, and all of that, I think of course that that's the ultimate goal. But I think it's a process. And I don't think it's, I mean, it certainly shouldn't be uh, forced or mandated, um, uh, uh, you know, through uh, legal mechanisms. Mm, yeah. It's interesting, Edwin. Let's, let's talk a little bit uh, back to basics about criminalization. We hear many, many arguments against criminalization. Um, if there was one argument which you thought was the most convincing, this is putting you on the spot, mm. how, how, would you, how would you convince somebody that criminalization was wrong? Well, I always uh, uh, have to talk about two things, about public health and about human rights. So from a public health point of view, um, laws that mandate disclosure or prosecute people um, uh, uh, for non-disclosure or exposure transmission are just ineffective as a, as a HIV prevention tool. Um, only a tiny, tiny minority of anyone who may ever be practicing unsafe sex or not disclosing Ever, ever becomes uh, 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 within the purview of the criminal justice system. So it's aff affecting a tiny minority. Um, but the, the publicity about it actually ends up doing more harm than good. I think it creates a false sense of security amongst people at risk of HIV that disclosure will happen. Um, and that's the, that's the way uh, that someone can protect themselves. And, and of course, it increases the stigma of HIV, which actually has a chilling effect on on talking about HIV. But then from a human rights point of view, and it's the, part, it's the reason that I do this work, it's really what drives me, although I'm concerned about public health, of course, is that um, the, most of these prosecutions are just unjust. Um, there are so many miscarriages of justice. There are so many ways that the courts are just misunderstanding the risk of HIV, the harm of HIV, are, are not uh, actually adequate, uh, adequately able to prove that one person uh, infected another. Um, and then, of course, you look at prosecutions for, for, for spitting or, or, or biting, um, which happen in the US and Canada relatively frequently, um, when there's really no risk at all. Um, you know, these prosecutions are based on stigma and not science. They're based on hysteria. Um, and so, uh, uh, really, uh, you just need to look at the reality of what it's like to live with HIV, understand the science, and appreciate that we don't need to use criminal laws to make people disclose or to have safer sex because most people living with HIV actually do those things anyway. Now, Edwin, I want to talk about the response here in Canada and also elsewhere, um, how we are fighting criminalization. And one of the terms we hear uh, quite a bit is prosecutorial guidelines. Now, you're going to have to explain for some of us what prosecutorial guidelines are and what, why that, that is um, a, a, a response which is being followed in, in, in several jurisdictions right now. Okay, so... Prosecutorial guidelines are basically produced for the, uh, for the prosecution to help them understand all of the issues relating to HIV and, uh, and its transmission, its risk, the harm of HIV, 
uh, how you prove uh, uh, these things. Um, they are used to limit the law. They're used to uh, as a sort of harm reduction. Um, they, and they be, the first prosecutorial guidelines were created in England and Wales, and they were a, a, a process that took time. And the HIV sector was not always at one, uh, uh, wasn't always agreeing that prosecutorial guidance were the way to go. But actually what happened was uh, it was really, uh, they found a way to have a very strong principled uh, that the HIV sector was, had a very strong principled approach. We don't agree with prosecutions, but we also know that they're happening and they're going to keep happening unless we actually work with prosecutors and help them understand what the problems are. So the HIV community was instrumental in, in developing those guidelines. Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, and I think that sort of uh, um, uh, pragmatic approach really is, um, it's, not, it's not the solution. There's always still going to be prosecute, uh, prosecutions, but they really have, uh, certainly in England and Wales, they have reduced the frequency of prosecutions and the, and the, the number of um, miscarriages of justice. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's some incredibly uh, uh, smart and well-educated and passionate activists working here uh, in Canada, and particularly in Ontario. Um, the, you know, the people working towards reducing the harm of prosecutions. And, you know, I think their campaign to get these, these guidance, guidelines is, is fantastic and to get the community on board. I know it's not necessarily 100% successful right now. And, of course, with the Supreme Court still awaiting, uh, to coming, we're still waiting for their decision, everything's sort of on hold. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have guidelines... Um, we are not going to be able to um, reduce, you know, all the collateral damage from prosecutions that really shouldn't be happening. Of course, we don't want any. Well, hopefully people say, we'd, unless, of course, somebody intends to harm somebody, actually does so and it can be proven. You know, that's the standard that the UNAIDS, who I, I've been working with as a consultant, that's the standard that UNAIDS has. And, and many of us believe that's the legal standard that the, the rest of the world should follow. So we're getting into the area of undetectable viral load, and, and that's, that's starting to change things up a bit. Yes, I mean, I think the, uh, uh, the Swiss statement uh, that came out in 2008 the, uh, uh, was instrumental in our understanding of the impact of treatment on infectiousness on an individual level. And in fact, the people that produced the Swiss statement, the, the Swiss Federal AIDS Commission, they actually did so because the law in Switzerland was so draconian. In Switzerland... It was not possible, uh, in fact, it, it still is not possible, although the law is about to change, it was not possible to even consent to the risk of transmission um, if, uh, uh, under their law. So that, and people were being prosecuted even when their partners were disclosed to and consented to having unprotected sex, for example, to have want to conceive. So um, the Swiss statement, the, the, whole, the whole rationale for the Swiss statement was actually to reduce... Uh, uh, unjust prosecutions in Switzerland and it's now of course had a worldwide impact and you know it's been argued uh, in the Supreme Court in Canada. Yes now one thing that struck me um, reading through the guidelines uh, from the UK it's very complicated uh, and and to to have um, prosecutors and I guess judges to understand the intricacies of things like undetectable viral load of the social issues which sort of drive up behavior is, is is a tough slog I think for some courts would you say is that a challenge that that um, it's so hard for, for a court to sort of understand this stuff I mean we we, we understand it probably better than, than they are, but it just struck me as very challenging mm -hmm. uh, a, a concept to get across to prosecutors or, or for judges for that matter. What would you say to that? Yeah, well, I think, it, again, it kind of highlights why the criminal justice system is such the wrong place. It's, it's, the, it, it's so inappropriate to, to, to use the police and the courts um, to deal with these issues that I think could be dealt with in other ways through uh, public health, through uh, community tribunals even just it's like the the ignorance about hiv and the risk and the harm of hiv and and all of the intricacies the problems of disclosure uh, i mean courts uh, have no idea about these things everything in in a in a court of law is is black and white and there's a victim and there's a perpetrator um the reality is that when it comes to sex um when it's otherwise consensual 
So when it's sex between adults, uh, yes, the issue often is, is whether disclosure happened or not. But taking aside the fact that uh, I consider two adults having sex, whether or not someone's disclosure rate should be positive status as being consensual. It's only in Canada that it's considered non-consensual. I mean, the, the paradigm is really strange here. Um, then uh, when two people, two adults are having sex, it's messy, it's complicated, it has nothing to do with being a victim and being a perpetrator. Do you think, Edwin, there is potential confusion uh, amongst people living with HIV who hear in the courts that undetectable viral load seldom leads to transmission of HIV and, and what we tell people from a prevention aspect when we essentially say that nothing much has changed, that undetectable viral load still means condoms are required. Is that an issue that we need to be concerned about? Yeah, I think this is part of the collateral damage of criminalization um, and the impact it's having on public health. Um, as I mentioned, the Swiss statement was produced primarily to deal with uh, a criminal law situation, um, and most of the public health agencies completely dismissed it. But of course, uh, early last year, we had the results of the, uh, the 052 study, which showed once and for all that uh, treatment can uh, is the most effective prevention uh, uh, method. Um, one of the problems, of course, is that all of the studies that we have so far have been done only uh, amongst uh, heterosexual couples. And, uh, and so in terms of messaging for gay men, we have, it, it's actually much, it's much more difficult. And it's, it, it's even more complicated now that we have other new prevention technologies such as PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and, uh, and what that also means in terms of responsibility for HIV prevention. So does someone who is taking PrEP um, could they still, uh, given that they're taking it because they're aware that they're at risk of HIV, uh, acquiring HIV, could they still complain uh, that they haven't been disclosed to, um, given that they're aware that there's a risk uh, and they're taking PrEP to, to prevent uh, that risk? Um, so uh, I think uh, one of the problems about criminalization, really it's, it's, the, it's the big issue, is that really you have no, there's no, uh, it's, there's no joined up thinking. You know, the, there's, a, there's a criminal process there's, and there's, uh, you know, departments of justice and then there's the, the public health concern and there's, you know, the public health departments. They don't talk to each other um, and they're actually at, at loggerheads with each other. I think, and until we can find a way to actually make sure that the criminal justice system and, and, uh, and people working in government, uh, uh, both on the legal and, and public health side, actually talk to each other and understand all the, uh, the collateral harms of criminalization, um, we aren't gonna uh, uh, resolve this. Things are getting better or things are getting worse? Um, hard to say. Um, I think we have some great uh, uh, scientific advances that can really help us certainly in, uh, in understanding really what, what significant risk is. Um, the problem is, is that because there are still uncertainties in science, um, it's possible to say that actually uh, uh, everyone with HIV should disclose. That's the argument that the, 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 they, that the uh, provinces have put towards uh, in the Supreme Court. Is it getting better? I think that there is a movement of people around the world, and, you know, and I've started this uh, organization, the HIV Justice Network, to link people who are working on this issue around the world. So we're learning from each other, we're supporting each other, and I think um, there are examples, uh, particularly in the Nordic countries, in Switzerland, um, uh, uh, and in, uh, and I mean, the great work that's happening in Canada, the activists in, in the United States, there was lots of things happening where we're actually uh, working to at least mitigate the harm. Changing the laws wh where there are laws is much harder. And then uh, whether the Supreme Court makes, it, makes the right decision or not actually is going to have an impact around the world. So, you know, let's hope that that all the interveners, the legal network and, and HALCO and all the other amazing people that have worked intervening at the Supreme Court, actually that their, their voices are heard. That's a good point to end on. Edwin from positivelight.com, thank you for coming to Toronto and talking to us and good luck with your work. Thank you, it's been a pleasure.